Our first Bible reading is taken from Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 9 to 14. Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 9 to 14. I'm reading from the New International Version, and let us hear the word of God. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a strong man overcome by wine, because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land lies parched, and the pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophets and priests are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and there they would fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw a repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. This is the word of God. Our second reading is taken from the second book of Peter, chapter 2, from verse 10b to 22. Second Peter, chapter 2, from 10b to 22. I am reading from the New International Version. Shall we please listen to the word of God? Bold and arrogant. They are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme and matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. The idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce unstable, They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beza, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water, mist and mist driven by a storm. Black as darkness is reserved for them, from 18. For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped from the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. 
it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to his vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. The word of God. Shall we turn to prayer? Let me encourage you to talk to the Lord this morning. He has been speaking to us from the very beginning. He's going to continue to speak to us. May the Lord speak to your heart and to my heart in accents that are clear and still. May the Lord speak to move us closer to the things that bring glory to his name and away from the things that dishonor him. We say, great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. You are awesome. You are amazing. Father, your presence with us guarantees our sufficiency, our security. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you care for every area of our lives. Whatever touches us, touches you. Thank you, Lord, for how far you have brought us as a church this year. We look up to you, Lord, alone in our onward journey. Take us to control. Continue to speak to us. Make us like our Lord Jesus Christ. May our lives continually bring you pleasure. May you continue to bless us and make us a blessing to all those our lives touch. Do this for your glory's sake, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> we continue our series, Beware of False Teachers. Beware of False Teachers. We started last Sunday looking at a theme, prepare to meet the Lord. Prepare to meet the Lord. So today we are continuing from where we left off. Beware of false teachers. Last Sunday, we saw that the character traits of false teachers are very clear. We looked at three of them last Sunday. Their language, the things they teach, the things they share. Their lifestyles, how they live, and then their legacy. The aftermath of their ministry. What happens, what they leave behind, their legacy. Not very pleasant. Not very helpful. Today we are looking at verses 10b to 22. Friends, I don't have a different story to tell. It's about more of the same. If you take time to read that passage or study it, you will discover that it's not a pretty story. These false teachers are brazen. They are bold. They are reckless. They are insolent. They are arrogant. They are described in many ways. One thing is certain. We saw that from last Sunday. One thing about these false teachers is certain. Each one of them, if you like, has written on, boldly on their foreheads, marked for demolition. God's judgment will come on them. God's destruction will visit them. It's only a matter of time. That is their end. Bound to happen. 
So this Sunday, I thought that I shouldn't just continue to offload on you more and more character traits of these false teachers. I thought that we should rather look at some real life false teachings that are awash in our world, in our part of the world. Today, we are engulfed in a lot of false teaching. And we have to be very, very, very careful. Very, very, very careful. Extremely careful. False teachers are seeking to destroy the church from within the church. That is what makes them even more dangerous. They are not working from outside the church, no. They appear to be part of us, our own members, our own leaders, our own teachers. And yet, the legacy they leave behind is only destruction. They lead astray many, especially young Christians who tend to be so gullible, eager to learn, willing to follow, happy to obey. These false teachers, they are dangerous. They are a danger to the church. So please come with me. Let us look at some examples to help us be more vigilant, be more on the lookout, and trust the Lord to help us because we are not in a very safe place. Not to frighten you, that is the reality. In looking at examples, I thought we should go back to the beginning, where it all started from, so that you will see who is actually behind all that is happening. The one who is behind all the false teaching and all the effort to destroy the church, if that were possible. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Please turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3. From verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The very beginning of false teaching. They come with a brazen opposition to what God has said. Try to malign the very word of God. We will see more examples later on. Did God actually say? Could God have said? Is that what God said? Are you sure? There's so doubt in your mind and in my mind. The woman's response, well, I don't know where it all came from. From her husband or I don't know. But by the time we get to verse 6, you realize that the woman has bought into the, the argument of the serpent. The suggestion, the recommendation of the serpent has taken over God's warning to the woman. God says, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, he said, if you eat from this tree, you will die. The serpent says, you will not surely die. Don't mind God, as we say in Luke Palace. Don't mind him. Haven't you come into situations where something communicates with you? Some argument comes to you and says, oh, don't worry about this one. Don't mind God. Go ahead and do it anyway. Nothing will happen. No consequence. False teaching. 
When God has spoken, he has spoken. There's no argument. There's no editing. You can't change it. You can't rehash it. The enemy will want you to find a way of watering down the gravity, the import of what God has said. The importance of God's language. God says, you will die if you eat. The enemy says, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. So as I said, from, from, you get to verse 6. The woman is convinced. That woman is convinced. What tragedy. That is how the first Adam failed. Spectacularly. In the first temptation. That is how. That has always worked. Undermine what God is saying. Undermine God's authority. And human beings will buy into it. Sell them power. Sell them beauty. Sell them taste. They will go for it. They will ignore God's warning and go for it. It has always worked. But let's go, let's come now to Luke chapter 4. The gospel of Luke chapter 4. The enemy seeks to do the same thing with the second Adam. The gospel of Luke chapter 4. Let's look at it from verse 9. This is the third in the series of temptations that the enemy is bringing to our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the line of argument. And he took him to Jerusalem. That is the enemy. To Jesus, to Jerusalem. And set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, to Jesus, if you are the son of God. You, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, and Satan quotes scripture. What I want you to do for me this morning is look at the quotation, what Satan quoted. He was quoting from Psalm 91. Look at the quotation carefully. Verses 10 and 11 of Luke chapter 4. And then leave one finger in your Bible there. Turn back to Psalm 91. And look at verses 11 and 12. Side by side. Please, what do you observe? What do you, what do you see? What the enemy quotes is directly from scripture. For it is written, and he quotes, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. If you are not like Jesus, and you don't see what is going on there, you will not understand the answer or response Jesus gave to this particular temptation. You won't understand. But I'm sure you have observed the difference. There's a difference between what Satan quoted in Luke's Gospel and the original in Psalm 91. Who can tell me what the difference is? Who has observed the difference? In Psalm 91, Scripture says, God will guard you in all your ways. In all your ways was cut out in the quotation that Satan gave. In the Luke passage, what Satan said does not include in all your ways. 
He only says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. So, check whether God will guard you in this situation also. Try it. Try it. Jump. But Jesus knew what the, the enemy had left out. His response was essentially to say, look, God says he will give his angels command over me to guard me in all my ways. All. There's no reason. There's no reason why I should tempt God in this particular situation to see whether he would fulfill his promise. He says he will guard me in all my ways. Sometimes the enemy will bring even scripture to your mind. His purpose is not to help you grow. No. If need be, he will use even scripture to help you to fall, to disobey God. So sometimes somebody close to you may come in the office, wherever, and say, well, let's do this, let's do that. Even the Bible says, heaven helps those who help themselves. You are scratching your head, wondering where in the Bible this one is. You won't find it anywhere. The reason why many of us fall prey to some of these things, some of these intrigues of the enemy, is that we are not eager. We are not interested in reading our Bibles. We can watch movies for hours on end, listen to messages, all that, social media. We don't really take delight in knowing the word of God. To God's word, somebody says it's like your hand. There are four ways you take in the word of God. You either hear it, read it, study it, or memorize it. When you are only hearing the word of God like a Sunday morning, the thumb stands for meditation and application. If all you do all week is only hear the word of God, it's like your little finger. So you hear God's word, think about it, try to apply it all week. That is all you have. That is how well you hold your Bible. That's how firmly you hold on to your Bible. If you add reading to it, morning devotion, personal devotion, you read a portion every morning, you plan to read through the Bible every two years or one year, etc. You add reading, you get a better grip on your Bible. Better grip. Bible study, small groups, area fellowship, whatever. Much firmer grip on the word of God. Hard memorization. You are getting there. Many of us lose this discipline or these disciplines. So whenever the enemy comes to us, even with a little trick, we can't discern what is going on. We fall for it. May the Lord help us be better, more knowledgeable of scripture so that when the enemy tries to hoodwink us, we will see through all his tricks and avoid the traps he sets for us like our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm not going to put God to, to the test because he already promised me that he'll guide me in all my ways. I know that. You left it out, but I know it. I won't fall for what you're asking me to do. The second Adam passed the test. That is why in one of the, our hymns, praise to the holiest in the height, and in the depth he prays. In all his words, most wonderful, most sure in all his ways. The second stanza says, oh, the loving wisdom of our God. When all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. He knew his own word. The enemy could not confound him. May God give you grace to know his word. You'll be safe. But let us come closer home. Let us come closer home. There's a certain 
concerted effort these days to try hard to undermine God's word in our generation. Many people are trying very, very hard to discredit the word of God. Then you have nothing to stand on as a believer. I'm sure some of you have heard of the expression hyper grace. Hyper grace. Simply put, it is the argument that if you're a Christian, your sins, past, present, and future, have all been forgiven. So when you sin, it doesn't matter. What you do in the flesh, with the flesh, doesn't matter. It doesn't count. God doesn't care about that. Therefore, you can be a Christian and still live in sin because God doesn't count your sins. Hyper grace. This is the grace of God, the beautiful doctrine of God's grace taken to a very ridiculous end. Romans chapter 6. Read that. It counters that beautifully for us. Know God's word. Do not fall prey to some of these things. In the past, there were people who were called antinomianists. They didn't care about any law of God. They said God's law didn't matter. Once you're a Christian, you're under grace. There's no moral law that guides you. That should dictate your way of life. Antinomianism. They don't care about the law. They're against the law. And so you can be a Christian and live however you like. Time will fill me to tell you how many young people, especially ladies, even on this campus, have been so deeply hurt by this doctrine, by this false teaching. Who have followed blindly people they respected into doing things that were against their consciences but because the man of God was saying it. They followed. Many fingers have been bent. May God protect you. May God protect me. Let me tell you about a gentleman who was called James Warren Jones. I was in the sixth form when he came up. He had a big church in somewhere in California in the U.S. This man was ordained by the Independent Assemblies of God Church as a pastor. But over time, he started teaching some very weird doctrines. One of them he called apostolic socialism. And when you raise eyebrows, they call it revi. That is revi. This man talked about the love of God, the love of Christ, the love of the church, and so managed to get all 3,000 members of his church to agree to sell their property, quit their jobs, bring the money to him so that they would set up a commune somewhere in South America in a country called Guyana. They called the place Jonestown. But as time went on, he began to abuse the members. More false teaching, more abuse. One morning in 1978, in November, he got it into his head for all the church members there to commit mass suicide. Jim Jones, as he was called then, mixed cyanide with some fruit juice and ordered that every member of the church present should drink it. We've been following his teaching. Now follow his command. Some people managed to run away through the jungle. 909 members drank the potion. All of them died. All of them died. The legacy of false teaching. 
it is gut wrenching. People's temple became people's suicide mission. These days, when a church leader is doing or saying something that is untoward, that doesn't honor God, and you try to question, they quote a verse of scripture to you. 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 22. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. False teaching. False teaching. Come with me to that passage, please. In 1 Chronicles 16, what we are seeing there is David singing or composing a song to thank God for his deliverance, his watchfulness, his protection over the people of Israel in all their travels. So what he says in verse 22 is actually in the past tense, referring to the entire nation of Israel. If you start from verse 19, David is saying, when you, people of Israel, were few in number, you couldn't have fought for yourselves, of little account and sojourners in the land, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. Talking about God. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, touch not my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Past tense. Past tense. Talking about God's protection of Israel. The entire nation. My anointed, my prophets, is referring to the nation of Israel. If you come today here and tell me that you are using this verse to guarantee your own protection, to make you an untouchable, so that no one can question you, no one can debate you, no one can confront you. You are teaching wrongly. It is false teaching. Don't buy it. It is false. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Israel. Appropriately, it should translate to all of us Christian believers, not just a few people. Let me bring you closer home. Today, in our country, there's a church leader, prominent, who is teaching that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is not enough. It can take you to heaven, but it's not enough to protect you from witchcraft and demons and other things. Unless and until you yourself bring a sacrifice that sacrifice will now protect you from witchcraft and demons. I don't know why people are doing these things. Is it because they want their church members to give more money? Here, we, when we need money, we say, please bring money. And people bring money. <laughs> There's no need to hoodwink people with twisted scripture. It is dangerous. It is evil. It is dishonoring to God. And this is happening in our country. How can you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public, public example of them, triumphant over them through the cross. How can you read a verse like that and tell me that Jesus' sacrifice was not enough to protect me from witchcraft? Without Jesus' sacrifice and what Christ has accomplished, for which region he could say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But for that, what will your sacrifice do? Your human sacrifice. Is it CDs or goats or yam? What will it accomplish? We have dangerous people lurking around in our country, posing as church leaders and teachers. May God help, help us, help you and help me. Beware of false teachers. They are around.
Let me share another one with you. In our sub-region today, there are people who are arguing that Paul's ministry, Paul's writings are not scripture. Maybe you have heard some of these arguments. Somebody says, Paul's letters were letters and the letter killers. Brofuna won't see an answer. Somebody actually made bold to say that he was praying and Jesus came to him and told him that what Paul taught was Paul's own doctrine and that it is not what Jesus taught. So he should ignore Paul and listen to Jesus. Do you realize that that kind of argument is saying that half of the New Testament is not scripture? These people malign the Apostle Paul. A man who took a pen, wrote a letter to a friend, Timothy, Titus, to a church. And for 2,000 years, no contradiction. Those letters are still blessing God's people. You will malign that person, but turn around and say that you can't say anything negative about some leaders on the scene today. You can't. You won't do that. A Paul, you'll attack. Friends, all I'm seeking to say this morning is be very, very careful. Be on the lookout. The enemy is on the loose. He's using people we have respected over the years, some of them, who are now teaching very weird doctrines, saying very disturbing things in big churches. Be careful. If you are going to listen to anything, anybody, keep your antenna up all the time. Be scanning the environment all the time. Ensure that what you are hearing is consistent with scripture. If it is music you are listening to, please ensure that everything there is consistent with scripture. If it's a movie you are watching, or oh, they have a way of sneaking these things in, movies. Be very careful. Be alert. Don't be watching and spending half of your time eating popcorn or something else. Be alert. Listen carefully. Some of them contain sentences, statements that are very, very unhelpful. That are meant to discredit God. Be careful. Watch out. There are false teachers on different platforms, in different places, sometimes you can't even imagine that they are there. But let me hasten to add that it is not when anybody is quoting scripture and leaves out a little portion that he becomes a false teacher. No, I'm not saying that. It happens to all of us. As we grow older and our memories begin to fail us, quoting scripture becomes a, a challenge. Not that. But where somebody intentionally omits to quote or state a portion of scripture just so that he'll get you to do the wrong thing, that is demonic. That is falsehood. Watch out for that. I'm not saying that anytime we disagree on something as a church becomes false teaching. That's, what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. No. I know that even with the hymns that I love so much, it's not every hymn that I sing. You'll be shocked to hear this. It is not every hymn that I sing. Once I scan it and it's not consistent with my understanding of scripture, I won't sing it. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Beautiful. But when you get to the stanza where he says, assured if I might trust betray, I shall forever die. I will not sing it. Because that is inconsistent with my own understanding of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Die forever, not me. Not me, no. 
So what I'm saying is, please, don't take anything for granted. Don't lose God. Shine your eyes. Be on the alert all the time, wherever you are, in every situation. There are false teachers out there. We won't always agree on everything as Christian believers. No. Disagreement doesn't mean there's false teaching going on. No. But there is false teaching going on. Intended to derail your faith, if that were possible. That is why you ought to be careful. I ought to be careful. Keep your antenna up. The Lord helping us, we shall be victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Would you like to say something back to God? Thank him for his word to us. Appreciate him for his protection of our lives. Father, we thank you for the perspicuity of scripture. Scripture is so plain. You are giving it to us for our instruction. But there are people who are working for your enemy, seeking to muddy the waters, seeking to bring confusion, and if possible, lead some of us, even many of us, astray. Father, we have no power of our own. In our best moments of vigilance, we still cannot, will not be able to See everything that the enemy is doing out there. Help us, Lord. Shield us, Lord. Protect us from every wile of the enemy. Give us the boldness to say no when we see falsehood. Not to follow out of respect for personalities. Father, our trust is in you alone. Help us. Keep us. Hold us in your precious hand. And Father, when we have turned around, help us to help our brethren also. Thank you that you are able to keep us because you have called us, you have saved us. You bring us to an expected end as you have ordained and guaranteed for us. You are able you have power to do this. Because of your love for us, you do this. To bring glory to your name and joy to our hearts through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. We shall. Thank you for Calvary. appreciate you joining our service today. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking on the logo and don't forget to like and share. See you next week. God bless you.